Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys, so much. All right. Thank you, guys, so much. Patrick Clark is our Minister of Worship Arts is out of town, so I appreciate uh, these two fellows leading us this morning. They asked me if that meant we were going to tag team the sermon also. I'm sorry you get one preacher today, and, and uh, you have to deal with that. I was privileged to go with uh, three of my kids to the Southern Baptist Convention this week with three others from our church as well. Um, and we had a good week. If you read the secular press, it was all bad, but uh, it was good. You know, when you get 10,000 Baptists in one room... And everybody has a vote. Everybody can make a motion. It's pretty crazy uh, that we don't all come out of there bloody, you know. So uh, the fact that we come out shaking hands and loving each other is actually a miracle in itself. Uh, But it was a a good week. You get 10,000 people together, no one's going to come home feeling like everything was exactly the way that they wanted to go. But there were some highlights. Of course, the biggest highlight is that at the convention, the International Mission Board has two or three commissioning services each year, but they have one at the Southern Baptist Convention, and that is the highlight. We commissioned, uh, and you did as well, 79 new international missionaries this week, and so that's a fantastic uh, thing. Yes, praise the Lord. There was great music, great preaching, um, a couple of task forces that gave their reports, one on disciple-making and one on evangelism. And while I want to pour more thoroughly through their, their study and their reports, I was encouraged because it's what you're trying to do here. And uh, so, was, again, there's always something more to learn, and I want to pour through those, but it was good. But it's always good to get home, and then to get home Friday night and get the gift of rain on Saturday. Um, yeah, I haven't smelled that smell after rain in a while. Of course, there's a reason I haven't smelled it in a while uh, here, but what a blessing that was. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for Father's Day. And and as we have sung this morning, thank you that you are our Heavenly Father, the perfect Father, that you are uh, the Father to the fatherless, Lord. And um, I pray today as we look at your word, this your rich, rich, beautiful word, You'd speak very, very clearly to us today. We've come in here to this room, a room full of folks with different backgrounds, different situations this morning, and I pray you'd take your word and you would tailor it and speak very clearly to each one of us. Lord, we just pray that you'd get glory in how your word is presented, received, and then how we respond to your word today. Resist the enemy and pray that your spirit would have complete freedom to reign and rule today. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, happy Father's Day to you, fathers. So thankful for you. Thankful for Sandia Baptist Church and just the joy it is to to be back with you this morning. But uh, Father's Day, as just as motherhood is a lot of work, fatherhood ought to be a lot of work. I mean, certainly there's some fathers that don't do the work, but biblical fatherhood is a lot of work. When all the children are small, that's a lot of physical work, just trying to keep up with everything going every different direction. I've entered into what I'm calling the air traffic controller stage of parenthood and just trying desperately to keep up with what's happening uh, in the home. And uh, we have one married with a baby and one coming. I have a daughter who entered into a courtship two weeks ago with a fine young man, have a son who was engaged last Sunday to a fine young lady, two that uh, rededicated their lives, firmed up their salvation at VBS and at children's camp, and then several more in the middle who are also making significant uh, changes in their lives as well. So there's a lot to this thing. No matter if you have one child or or however many uh, you might have, it's a lot of work. But with all that there is to do as a father and as a parent, but we're talking to fathers and we're talking to all of us today, with all that there is to do, with all of the challenges we face, with all that is working against us, what's the one thing that we have to give our children? And it's the Word of God. And we're going to look at Paul here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 through 17. Now, earlier, before we began the 2 Timothy study. We looked at the second part of this passage, 
So we'll look at it briefly, but we'll begin with verse 10 today and look at this entire passage. Verses 10 through 17 of 2 Timothy chapter 3. And Paul says to Timothy, Now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all, the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue. In the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, And that from childhood you have known the sacred scriptures, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. We have two choices to make in this life. We're going to look at the the two choices that we can make in relation to God's Word today. But as we look at this passage, there's, there's one imperative, there's one instruction. There, there are several things that we're told, that Timothy was told, and we're told to know this, remember this, be aware of this, but there's one instruction, and that word is continue, Amen. found later in the passage there. So that's the word for us today, is to continue as we make these two choices. So we're going to look at these two choices and look then at one indispensable tool in making that right choice. Well, the first choice is what we see here in Paul, and that is to pursue righteousness, to, to attempt to hold on to the Word of God, not just in what we believe in our head, but what we're trying by God's grace to practice in our life. Paul says here in verse 10, He's writing to Timothy. Timothy is going through difficulty. There's a a difficult situation that Timothy's facing as he's trying to teach the truth, as he's trying to teach the Word, and there are those who are opposing him. There are those who are teaching false doctrine. And so Paul's encouraging Timothy, and he backs up in verse 10 and says, Timothy, you know very well, you followed, and he has a long list here, my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, Well, those all sound fun, but then he kind of transitions here. Perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings. Timothy, you're very well aware. In fact, uh, Paul says of Timothy elsewhere, there's none quite like him in how he has followed, supported, kept up with Paul and what God was doing in Paul's life. He says, Timothy, you're aware of all those things, and you're aware of uh, the good things, the things that are pleasant, but you're also aware that I was persecuted and suffered And certainly Paul was. He lists three cities here, and you can read about what happened to Paul in all these cities. At Lystra, his hometown, he was stoned and left for dead. I've had people oppose me over the years, you know, at various times. We all have had people oppose us, but I've never been stoned and left for dead. And uh, so that's quite a persecution and a suffering. But Paul says at the end of verse 11, all these things you know, Timothy, but the one thing you also know, Out of them all, the Lord rescued me. So choice one is going to bring persecution. If you really seek to follow God in your life and not in a closet, not hidden, people say, well, I don't wear my religion on my shirt sleeves. I think, well, where do you wear it? You know, I mean, might as well wear it on your shirt sleeves because it's not going to do anybody any good if you wear it in your closet. If you do, you'll be persecuted. But like Paul, in God's way, in God's time, out of them all, you will be rescued. And it may be that you die for your faith, but even then you'll be rescued because then you will live forever in heaven, joyed, overjoyed that you were chosen to give your life for the Lord. Now, we don't seek martyrdom. I was teaching missions on furlough many years ago at Dallas Baptist University and uh, was grading papers. And one of the students at the end, I'd always ask, is there anything else you'd like me to know? We've been studying missions. And he wrote, I feel like God is calling me to be a martyr. Well, what do you, as the the professor, what do you say? Great. (laughs) You know, I didn't really have a 
a, a trite reply to that. Uh, but, uh, you know, most of us don't feel that calling to be a martyr. But whatever happens, if you're living for the Lord, if you're pursuing righteousness and you're not hidden about it, God will rescue you. In case we didn't get it, Paul goes on in verse 12 to say it this way. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's not my life verse. That's not at the top of my memory chart. And some would say, well, if that's the case, then I'm out. No thanks. I'm just going to squeak by. Well, you've just entered into a miserable existence as a believer. To know the truth and to know what God has saved you from and to try to squeak by, you've entered into the worst of all cases. Oh, there's the lost man. Oh, oh, he's ruining his life. He's banging his head against every wall he can find and doesn't know why. But he doesn't even have the same degree of misery that you do as a believer to know what God has saved you from and to still not be trying to follow him and to, to... Feel the Lord's rescue is better than anything that you might have given up in order to pursue righteousness and to pursue the Lord. So Paul says, you're going to be persecuted, but Paul is essentially saying, I've found something so valuable, and it's Christ Jesus, that I'm willing to be persecuted for him because it's worth it. And the world around us, the people that you work, with whom you work, the people uh, in your neighborhood, the people in your extended family... If they don't know Christ, they're searching. They're searching. Do you remember if you came to Christ old enough? Do you remember that you were searching? What is it that makes life worth living? What is it that makes it worth getting up in the morning? And they're searching. And when they see religion, the kind where you just, oh, I see their car drive off on Sunday. They seem to wear a little bit nicer clothes. Uh, but there's nothing to it. Well, that doesn't do anything for them. But when they see you at work, when they see you in the neighborhood, when they see you in the extended family and they say, that person has found something that is so valuable that they're willing to be different. They're willing to give up certain things. They're willing to add in certain things. Just like when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were put in the fire, when Daniel was put in the lion's den, and on and on, God was glorified and everybody saw there's something that caused these crazy men to be willing to put in, be put into a fire or to be put into a lion's den. And there are people that live near you, and there are people that work by you, and there are people who, that know you, and they're looking. And God is saying, would you be willing to wear not your religion, but your walk with Christ on your shirt sleeves? You may be persecuted. You may be outcast. You may walk up to the circle of people, and when you walk up, they get quiet. But it will be worth it. God will rescue you, and God will will use them and use you. So, choice one, persecution, but a rescue. Choice two, and we won't spend very much time here, but in verse 13, Paul says, but on the other hand, as, as opposed to this, in contrast to this, evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. And that's a pretty bad description. Now, you know, you never want that to be said of you. A, that you're an evil person, or an imposter, one who doesn't know Christ and is trying to lead people astray, and you'll start it bad and get a little worse. That's, that's, that's pretty rough. So Paul says, on the other, on one hand, you, you're, you're going to pursue righteousness. You're going to walk deeply with Christ. You're going to enjoy the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. But there will be persecutions that come with it. But you'll experience the rescue of God like Daniel did, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did, like Elijah did. You want to experience that? Or... You can go the other way. You can jump off into the stream of current thought and current living, and you can go from bad to worse. You'll be deceiving others, and there are those who deceive us. In fact, Paul's persecution, where did it come from mostly? From believers. Believers who didn't like that Paul was teaching the truth because it makes us uncomfortable. It brings conviction. And there are those who deceive, those who twist the word, those who purposely ignore the word, those who, because of their own lifestyles, want to soften and weaken the word. And so they deceive, and he says, but at the same time, they're being deceived. It's the blind leading the blind. I'm not going to camp out here, but if you're in that category, get out today. If you don't know Christ as Savior, here in a few minutes, you come. And let us explain to you how you can know God 
through Christ who died on the cross for you. And you can be set free from being described as is described in verse 13. But let's move on then. The indispensable tool that will help you if you make choice one to follow after the righteousness of God. And here comes that imperative verb here in verse 14. Paul says, you, however, Timothy and us, continue. Now that sounds innocuous, easy, continue. That's pretty easy to continue something until we stop and think about what he's saying here. For you in 2018 as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ to continue in the Word, not just believing that it's true in your head, but actually investing your time in it, living it out, letting the Word of God, as we sang about this morning, change us and change us from the inside out, brainwash us in the positive sense, change the way we think. God said, my ways are higher than your ways, he says in Isaiah, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. But he never said, so don't try to know them. When we get into the Word, we begin to know even deeper and deeper and deeper, not just the words that we have here printed for us in English, but even God's heart behind them as He wrote them. So you, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you've learned them. And you know Timothy's story here. Most of you, Timothy was raised by his mother and his grandmother. He had a physical father in the home, but his father wasn't a believer. So spiritually, he's raised by Lois and Eunice here. He says, remember, and he goes on here, he says, and that from childhood you knew these things. Many in this room, like me, had the gift of growing up knowing these truths as a child. Some of you didn't. But he says to Timothy, you've known them from your childhood. You've become convinced of them. So Timothy... There's always something new coming down the pike. There's always someone saying, you know what? I I now understand that what everyone in Christianity has understood to be true for the last several thousand years, I know it differently now. When you find something in the Scripture that no one else has found in the last 5,000 years, you're not necessarily wrong, but be careful. When because the calendar page has turned and it's now 2018, that changes everything? Be careful. And so he says, Timothy, you know you've become convinced of these. You had these given to you day in and day out as a child by your mother and your grandmother. So stick with them. And there will always, always be challenges to God's Word in at least two fronts. And I'm talking about within the church. Oh, there's always a challenge to God's Word outside the church. But within Christianity, the first challenge is always about its inerrancy. Is every word in the Scripture given by God true? And where you don't understand something, where I don't understand something, where something seems to be in conflict, the problem is always me, not God's Word. There are pages of errors found in the Word that for a long time no one knew why. And there are pages of examples of those errors that when study was finally, finally, finally completed. Oh, I get it. God knew once again more than we knew. So first, the inerrancy of Scripture. And and once you begin to take some away, it's as many have called a slippery slope. Well, if this, I say, is not true, well, then what about this? And then you get to that, as I sometimes talk about, you get to that loose-leaf Bible, and you begin tearing the pages out, and uh, you begin to get to Thomas Jefferson's uh, self-made Bible and so forth. So the inerrancy of the Scripture, but not just the inerrancy of the Scripture. And as Southern Baptists, we had a long, several-decade discussion, uh, if you will, about the inerrancy of the Scripture. And currently, all of our seminaries are teaching the Word of God as inerrant, true, infallible, in everything about which it speaks. It wasn't meant to be a science book, but every time it mentions science, it's true. It wasn't meant to be a history book, but it mentions history, it's true. Now, you have to be careful. Some will say we believe the Word of God is infallible in all matters of faith and practice. Not always, but sometimes that's a veiled way to say we don't really believe it's true in every part. It is true in every part. But the second front comes with the sufficiency of Scripture. And that's where it gets more difficult. Do I really believe it has the answers for every part of my personal life, my family, my marriage, and my church? 
Do I really believe that this is the sole authority and the tool? And the fight will always be there. So Paul says to Timothy, Paul says to me, continue, continue in the things which you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you learned them, and that from childhood you have known these sacred writings. And so we're reminded on Father's Day that every parent in the home needs to be teaching the Word to their children. But fathers, if there's a father in the home, you've got to. You've got to be. And I use the word teaching and it scares you. You've got to be opening the Word of God with your family. Nothing would thrill me more than in, in, as a response to this charge from Paul today that whether during the invitation time or after, that fathers would come to me and say, you know what, I've never done that. I read the Bible personally, but we've never ever read the Bible as a family, except maybe Christmas Eve. But we've never had that as a regular part of our, our practice. And you'd come to me and say, Pastor, by God's grace, I'm going to start doing that. And I'm telling you, start simple. Just get the family in the same room and, and read a passage, a few verses, a chapter. Just read it. You don't have to teach anything. And pray. That alone, if that's all you ever did, and many nights that's all we do, just says this book is important to mom and dad, not just on Sunday. But I'm going to tell you that it's going to grow. And you'll get to where I'm at, where my children teach me during family devotions. Some nights are very short, some nights are longer. I've got lots of different uh, methods and ways you can do it that we've used over the years. But just doing something. Start. And moms, if you're a single mom, of course, you've got to do this without dad. And we're sorry about that. But you do it just like Lois and Eunice did. Here's the good news. You think, well, I'm handicapped because I'm a single mom having to do this without a dad. Okay? But you might be raising a Timothy who became a leader in the New Testament church. And spiritually, he was raised by his mother and his grandmother. From childhood, you've known them. What, what are the effects of that, Timothy? Why, Paul, did Timothy learn them? Is it just so that he could have knowledge in his head? And Paul gives us a beautiful reason right here. You've known the sacred writings, which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of the word. I mean, it, there's many more purposes, but that's the ultimate purpose, is that we get the wisdom. So, Timothy, you read the sacred scripture with your mom and your grandmother, and it helped you to have the wisdom that led to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. That's the biggest need that we ever have. If that's all you did, and you never taught your kids how to even tie their shoes, but you led them to God's word, and God through his word gave them the wisdom which told them that they're a sinner. And we're all sinners. That's the biggest thing we need to gain here, that we're sinners, and then there is a Savior who died in our place. So that you don't raise religious children who say as an adult, I went to church, therefore I'm a believer. My parents were Christians, therefore I'm going to heaven. But you let them see in the word of God that they were sinners, but that Jesus died in their place. I'll tie their shoes for them if you'll teach them about Jesus, okay? We teach them many, many things. Be sure we're teaching them the Word of God. Gave you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And parenthetically here, some of you today, you're here and you don't know Christ Jesus. You are religious. You believe there's a God. You check Christian when you go into the hospital, but you really don't know that if you died right now, you'd go to, to be with God in heaven. We want you to know that God has brought you here today so that you would know that you, like us, you're a sinner, but that Jesus died in your place. And today you can come and say, I don't understand everything, but if there's a God who loves me that much, I want to give my life to him and receive forgiveness of sin from here. So, Timothy, pursue on, continue on in these things. And then these familiar verses, 16 and 17, all. And the word there in the Greek means all. All Scripture. Every bit of it. From Genesis to maps. All of it is inspired. I'm kidding about the maps part. Don't send me emails about the maps. Uh, they ought to be right. 
It is inspired. The word means, you've heard it before, the word means God breathed God miraculously over the period of 1,600 years from the very first pen stroke of the writing of the Bible to the very end, 1,600 years, about 40 different men in three different languages over several continents, and he put together a book that used their writing styles, their hands, and yet it's one continuous God-breathed book. The miracle of the writing of it, which was this, this is this, the inspiration that God breathed. The miracle of the canonization as over a few hundred years, the church fathers in deep prayer led in the same way as the writers used by God to determine what exactly was the word of God. And then the miracle of preservation that you and I hold the same thing as they did in these early days. And why would God bless it? if it had error. Why would it be such a book that in North Korea and in Sudan and in communist countries around the world they would not allow it in? It's just a book, right? No, it's a living, breathing book because it's the Word of God. All Scripture inspired by God and profitable. It's a tool for you, Timothy, for teaching and for proof and correction, for training in righteousness. And again, we, we looked at this a couple of months ago, so I won't repeat all of those things there. But all of these things, the Word of God is the plumb line, that correction and reproof. The correction shows the problem, shows the broken bone, and the reproof is to fix the broken bone. It's the plumb line there. It has to be. The, 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 the sole authority. It has to be the trump card for all that we do as individuals, as families, as a church. We, we, I mean, imagine trying to get us to all agree on pizza toppings I mean, in a room this size. We couldn't do that. We can't agree on anything down to the detail. So there's got to be something that's right when all of us feel right. And so this has to be what's right, the Word of God. Now, none of us are following it perfectly. No church is following it perfectly. But it has to be our intention, our pursuit to see how we can line ourselves up with God's Word. And then when we do, we'll be persecuted. Wonderful promise from God to you. But when you do, He will rescue you. So the plumb line, it cannot be kosher. It cannot be suitable for us at Sandia Baptist Church to ever say or even think, I know the Bible says, comma, but dot, dot, dot. It's okay to say, I don't like that. I'm not there yet. I don't, I, I, that troubles me. But we have to understand that the book is right because it's the Word of God and that I am wrong and the problem is me, not the Word of God. So he says it's all of these things so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So that's the cycle we want to be on. We don't want to be on the cycle of being evil men and imposters who are going from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. We want to be in this cycle where we're, by God's grace, you saw these parents here today with these precious children, that by God's grace we're saying, God, I'm going to do my part in making sure my kids are in the Word so that they are led to the wisdom that brings salvation to the faith which is in Christ Jesus. And then by God's grace, I'm praying that when they grow up and have kids, they do the same so that we get into that kind of cycle. But then some of you would say, well, but I didn't get that as a child. That's okay. I'm not going to have you raise your hands. I was going to. But in this room, there's probably a hundred of you adults out of the however many of you that are here who are currently enrolled in some class somewhere. Every year, adult students go back to school. And they make the best grades usually too because they're serious. If you didn't get it, go back to school now and dig into God's Word. And you become adequate and equipped for every good work. And then you begin the process of whoever is in your influence. If you have children, yes. Grandchildren, yes. Others, yes. You begin pouring yourself into others. you discipling your children, discipling other adults. I'm so thankful for Pastor Garland and others who are working with him in trying to make sure every believer we already have in our fellowship is going through a basic discipleship one-on-one, -on -one, and then every new member, every new believer going through as well. This, this cycle of training others in the Word of God so that the Word of God becomes the sole authority, the ruling document for all that we do. The first time I went to Senegal, uh, and some of you have been to third world countries, and, and you come out, one of the biggest shocks is just there at the airport when you come out, and it's, uh, it's, it's just a circus. And in Senegal, everyone knows how to say in English, I'm your driver, even though they're not your driver. 
And so the missionary wasn't, wasn't meeting us there. Uh, after uh, the first trip or two, we were on our own and, and getting ourselves out to the villages. And uh, so, but he had told me, uh, he had set up the transportation this first time. And he said, your driver's name is Ibrahima. And so I'm hearing all these people, I'm your driver. No, you're not. I'm your driver. No, you're not. I didn't tell, I didn't tell him that. And until finally someone walked up to me and said, Mr. Cooksey, I'm Ibrahima. I said, you're my driver. And I'm not going to let you out of my sight. That's what the Word of God does. Everything around us, I mean, we can't believe the rate that society is changing. And so we've got to be in the Word so we recognize what's from God and what's not from God. Individual, continue in the Word of God. Couple, continue in the Word. Family, continue in the Word. Church, continue in the Word of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And Lord, speak to all of us today. There are none of us who don't have room to grow here. Renew, deepen our love for your word, not because of the pages and the book, but because of the content that is the living word of God. It's you and your heart. And help us to wake up longing to be with you in your word. Help us to want to know it, to memorize it, to meditate on it, and then especially to put it into practice as individuals, as families, as a church. Help none of us to be deceivers, leading others astray. Oh, God, you've warned us so powerfully how serious it is to you when we lead other believers away from you. And help us to be those who are living in, relishing in, joying in your word in such a way that it's so contagious that it spreads through our church that people would say they don't have it all together over there at Sandia but boy they love God's word and father let it dictate rule guide our lives and then Lord when we're fearful of being persecuted help us to know that you will rescue us and the rescue from persecution is a thousand times more enjoyable or more than the dearth of going away from you and going from bad to worse. Lord, there are some in this room today who don't know you as Savior. They, they're good people. They believe in you, but they've never come to know you. God, help them to see today. Help them to come and receive what you've done for them on the cross. Lord, there are so many others. Let us be a responsive people. The things that you've laid on our hearts today, let us come and kneel and pray. Let us grab another believer and talk to them. Let us come and grab a pastor by the hand. Lord, some need to follow you in believer's baptism. Some need to make this their church home for this time until you make a change. But for this chapter in their life, they're saying, yes, this is me. This is where God is calling me. Oh, Lord, so many things. Would you move and would you work and would you get glory? We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stay.